recording. There we go. Uh, all right, and I suspect we'll have folks uh, joining the call as we get into the hour here. But again, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, this is uh, uh, our third uh, in, a, in a sort of an ongoing special topic series uh, regarding the COVID virus. Uh, of course, we're all uh, very aware of the pandemic uh, that, that we're sort of uh, working our way through. And so this organization, uh, Linux Foundation, of course, Hyperledger particularly, and then this uh, healthcare special interest group uh, especially, has been uh, over the past month and a half really focusing on uh, talking through some, some ways to help uh, drive solutions to this, uh, to this pandemic. And so the, the format uh, for, again, for this special uh, topic meeting uh, we'll sort of walk through. Uh, first and foremost, I want to uh, just let everyone know that we are re recording this, um, and so please be aware of that and be, be sensitive to that. As well, uh, we do have a Linux Foundation antitrust policy that I uh, just want to make sure that everyone's aware of. Please review that. Uh, there's a URL there uh, for details on our antitrust policy. In short, it means uh, please be a good person. Uh, don't share any information that you think to be IP. Uh, this is an open source, uh, open community meeting, uh, and so uh, be aware of that. Um, we do have quite a number of folks on the call, uh, and I suspect we'll be gathering them, uh, uh, collecting them along the way. Um, just, let's see, well, let's see if we can walk through this very quickly. So uh, anyone on the call want to introduce themselves just very briefly, say hello, and, and tell us a little bit about yourself? Go ahead, Indra. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm dialing in from Austin, Texas. Um, I just kind of uh, accidentally saw this in LinkedIn, and I'm happy to join this call. And uh, I have um, I've been an IT professional in global IT roles in the five out of seven continents in the last 25 plus years. And um, uh, my last role was with uh, Huffman La Roche, um, biotech pharma company, five and a half years in global IT leadership role, so in medical device industry. And then um, since I left Roche in the last two years, and I have been heavily invested in learning about blockchain and spe especially focused on healthcare. I'm very passionate about blockchain, healthcare intersection, uh, learning a lot about hyperledger as well. So I'm glad to be a part of this um, group, and I intend to join this group and come to regular meetings and learn more and find opportunity if I can contribute anyway. Oh, excellent. Well, great to have you, Indira, uh, and uh, uh, fantastic that you have a great uh, background in, uh, in the healthcare space, and particularly uh, happy to have your, your interest sort of getting exercised here. So great, great to join us. Uh, I, I would, uh, and this is true for everyone that's really very new to this, uh, to this special interest group, uh, feel free to take a look on our wiki page here, because uh, uh, this, even though this is a special uh, topic meeting, uh, we do get together every two weeks uh, as, a, as a large group. This is a membership of about a thousand members. Uh, we're uh, clearly international uh, and our focus really is looking at ways to solve uh, problems in the healthcare industry using blockchain technologies. And so this is really a great opportunity for, for anyone to sort of, get, uh, sort of get involved. So thanks very much. Uh, M. Novak, go ahead. And please unmute yourself. Uh, oh, we, my, we yeah, there am I you muted go. now. Yep, you're good. Thank go you. Ahead. <laughs> good morning. So, good morning. This is uh, Michael Novak. I'm in beautiful downtown Arlington, Virginia, and uh, working with a company called Simba Chain. We focus on smart contracts, and I'm excited to be here. I've been involved with blockchain in general for about the last five or six years, I'm a member of the Government Blockchain Association work with smart city councils and work with a variety of other uh, interest groups that are focused on how we can use web 3.0 technology to improve things like the processes and workflows in healthcare. Excellent. Uh, great to have you on the call. Uh, and again, welcome. And yeah, we'd, we'd love to have you uh, get more involved in, in this uh, special interest group uh, and Hyperledger in general. Uh, it's a it's a great organization, and again, we are open source, open community. So uh, you're you're clearly free free to get involved at a level that you feel comfortable with. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate yeah, and I was lucky. Real quick, I was lucky. I uh, attended the uh, uh, Hyperledger forum just before COVID brought the dark skies upon us. 
So I was very excited to uh, get involved very closely with the presentations on DIDs and the applications. Oh, yeah. Oh, excellent. Oh, very good. Good to hear. Well, again, welcome. Great to have you. Uh, Jeff. Uh, this is, I'm Jeff Stolman. I live outside of Philadelphia. And uh, I've been part of this group for a long time, but I have been absent for probably a year and a half just because of the work schedule I'm on. Uh, but I'm very interested in developing tools and solutions in blockchain and actually have been on the side lately working on a uh, way to get the right to be forgotten that can be appended to any blockchain. Yeah, excellent, Jeff. And and uh, Jeff, you're sort of a long, long time member. You've been around since the inception uh, of really of the organization. So great to have you uh, back in, in the fray, Jeff, and uh, good to hear from you again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Anisu. Hello, um, my name is Anesu. Uh, I've been involved with uh, Typology in for a while, but this is my first time uh, participating in this call. Uh, we are a startup that is doing prepayment claims verification, uh, but within that, there's a, a lot of other interesting things as well that is to do with COVID that we are learning as we are trying to implement this. We have a pilot scheduled in September with Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina. And then we'll get a chance to talk about it in, during the presentation. But uh, well, this is my first time, and we're you know we're also a startup, so just doing the, pre, the 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 introduction before the presentation, so that doesn't cut into my time. So that's all. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Anesu, and and yeah, and Anesu will be speaking. Uh, he's one of our guest speakers for for the day. So uh, great to have you on the call. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else want to introduce themselves? Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Ankit Jain. Um, I have joined the general meeting uh, time and time again. I have tried to be more involved in it, but I, I work with Ravish um, on the pair subgroup, and I'm filling in for him today. Excellent. Ankit. And then uh, when we get into community announcements, I'll probably circle back around to you and, and we can talk a little bit more about what the, what the pair sub subgroup is up to very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Alrighty, anyone else before we get moving? Excellent. Uh, well, thanks everyone uh, again. And uh, because we do have quite, an, uh, an, uh, 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 quite a few new members uh, or, or visitors joining us, I do wanna mention we do have a membership directory. Uh, feel free to jump on uh, and uh, make, an, uh, make some edits, introduce yourselves. It's a great way to connect sort of person to person. Uh, and uh, we, we sort of continue to grow this out over time, and it's been a great way to sort of keep people sort of in touch outside of these general meetings. These general meetings happen every two weeks. As well, we also have uh, three separate subgroups, uh, and those subgroups really are sort of boots on the ground. They tend to be very, very focused on, uh, on applications in the healthcare industry as it relates to our patient subgroup our payer uh, subgroup, which uh, clearly uh, both of those are focused on those areas of interest, as well as our uh, interoperability uh, subgroup. And so uh, we've got three great subgroups that are very active and they tend to operate at about that same, uh, same sort of cadence every couple of weeks they get together. Um, so uh, we're gonna move forward uh, and talk a little bit about community announcements uh, and also feel free to sort of interject if you have something else that you'd like to add, but. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about our, our mentorship program. This is, I believe, our fourth year uh, for the mentorship program. It's really intended for, for students uh, and, uh, and young people just getting out of school and, they, and finding a way to get connected into the community here. Uh, that is, it's a great opportunity. Uh, we've got quite a number of projects uh, to get involved in. So if you are uh, or know someone who's a student, uh, feel free to get involved through that webpage. Uh, the application deadline is coming up. It's about a week out, so uh, you may want to sort of get moving if you have uh, an expressed interest in uh, getting involved in that program. Uh, okay, and then I do have a special note from our uh, payer subgroup. Uh, Ankit uh, is on the call. Uh, in short, we're uh, through that subgroup, we're spinning up a new pharmacy POC that's starting next week. Uh, it'll be uh, utilizing uh, Hyperledger Fabric, which I think most people are familiar with, uh, uh, as well as uh, Jagat's 
uh, low code low code uh, platform. Uh, which uh, Enkit, do you want to talk a little bit more about this POC? And uh, be sure to unmute yourself. And perhaps we may we may have missed Ankit. I see him, but I just I don't see him talking. So yeah, uh, I, oh, oh there we go. Excellent. Yeah. Good, good, good. Double mute the hazards. <laughs> yes. All right. Hey, hey everybody. Um, so we have been making we've been having some good contributions, making some good progress on the pair subgroup. Uh, the last three sessions we discussed uh, the we discussed the use case of um, of prescription management and how it relates to both fraud and abuse and the convenience of users uh, or you know of patients um, that you can or wiki and the use case has been published on a uh, on a powerpoint slide we keep adding to it uh, we have been engaging with the patient subgroup uh, to integrate with the patient consent part of it so that's the work that we have been doing now next week's session next friday at one eastern standard we have a very important session because uh, we're doing a we're doing a working session where we will show the fabcar example uh, we'll show how to create an application around it without coding so if you're technical users or you're not non-technical users or if you know anybody who would be interested in it please uh, feel free to uh, forward them our email, our uh, you know our connection details, etc. And uh, and we're really just trying to get more and more people in to show them how easily we can tap into blockchains without having to code this around, without having to code these around, and really leverage blockchains for 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 its strength purpose. Excellent. Well, very good. Uh, thank you for that, Ankit. Uh, and again, patient uh, subgroup. We have a we have a link to that here. Uh, again, it's every other Friday. It's it's sort of uh, in line with uh, with our regular meetings here. Uh, and uh, great to have uh, you on Ankit and uh, very interesting projects sort of spinning out of uh, out of that. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Anyone else want to uh, make uh, an announcement uh, within the HCC community here? Uh, just generally speaking, uh, we'd want it to be healthcare related uh, as it relates to blockchain technologies. Uh, otherwise, we'll get into our discussion. Alrighty. Okay. Well, so uh, this is the third uh, in a continuing sort of series. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, this is all about our COVID-19 virus pandemic. Uh, and really what we're doing is we're sort of turning our resources to finding ways to, uh, to solve some of the problems that we have in this space. Uh, we've uh, sort of brought in guests from around the world and we're continuing to do, to do that today. Uh, we have a couple of uh, guest speakers uh, that will be talking on the topic. Uh, so if we have uh, Mark, I see Mark on the call. Good morning, Mark. Uh, so I'll hand over to you. Uh, our, you're a global blockchain solutions leader for healthcare and life sciences at IBM. Uh, Mark, take it away. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, great. Good morning. Excellent. It worked. This is often the hardest part, getting, <laughs> getting the online meeting to work. But uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for having me in your group today. Yes, I'm, my name is Mark Treshak. I'm our global solution leader for blockchain but specific to the healthcare and life sciences industries. So that covers everything from what you would think of as patient or clinical data uh, all the way through to the supply chain, which is something I'm going to talk for a little bit about today. And I want to talk about a, a solution that's just launched. It's launching, it's in soft launch now. It'll, it'll launch over the weekend, but the, um, the website, which is uh, in, in your link, you know, you could go and see it. Uh, we call it Rapid Supplier Connect. Uh, we call it Rapid Supplier Connect. So this is something that's been stood up specifically for the COVID crisis. Uh, and we've MacGyvered it together from different things that IBM has, at the, has in its toolkit. And MacGyver is not a legal term. So the legal folks always get upset with me when I use that. So I'm just kidding a little bit here. So what we're what we're trying to do, you know, I'm sure that everyone has seen, you know, that care facilities and hospitals all over the U.S. and the world, uh, they're running out of stuff. Right? We've seen these these horrible, 
heartbreaking images of nurses wearing garbage bags because they don't have PPE and, and, and things like that. And, you know, that's tragic. And, and then on the other side of that, it's magnificent that companies all over the world are kind of repositioning themselves to help meet this need, right? Because the, the typical or traditional supply chain makers of these this equipment, they're, they're kind of tapped out. So what do I mean? I mean, I'm sure you've all seen uh, the case where General Motors is making ventilators and Dyson in the UK, the vacuum company is making ventilators. Uh, and, and that's fantastic. And think of that as being on one end of the spectrum. And then on the other, you have things like PPE, personal protective equipment. So masks, gowns, gloves, and then you have everything in between right? Everything in between, uh, everything in between. And you have companies all over the world that are doing this. So, you know, more on the other side, you see, you see companies, apparel companies like Ralph Lauren or Gap, right? Spinning up to make PPE and masks Um, and and kind of a wide range of of suppliers along that continuum. And that's great, but it, it gets to another problem. It's if you're a, a hospital in, let's say, New Hampshire, if you're the director of procurement in a hospital in New Hampshire, how would you ever connect to a apparel maker in Brazil who's now making this equipment, right, that you need? Because you don't run in the same circles, right? And then let's say you do happen to find them or they find you, how do you know who they are, right? I mean, it could be a billion dollar company right, in Brazil, just to keep using that example, and you, you as, a, as a buyer in, in a hospital would have no idea, right? So how do we close this gap? And that's, um, that's where this rapid supplier connect solution comes in. And it's designed to make it possible for buyers and suppliers, including these non-traditional suppliers, to quickly find each other and to accelerate the verifications and onboarding that need to be done and then to gain kind of near real-time insight into their available inventory. And now we'll get into you know, how blockchain is involved in this. So as, as I said, we kind of MacGyvered this together between uh, some existing solutions. So for the supplier identity piece, right, we use a platform called Trust Your Supplier, which is live today. And if you go to the Trust Your Supplier website, you could see that. And you know, what's involved there is that if you're a supplier, you could join this platform and you create a digital identity or wallet for yourself, right? And and in this wallet, you would post kind of information and documents and certificates of compliance, all kind of things that, you know, normally go into uh, uh, a company establishing their bona fides uh, that, you know, they would need to prove before a buyer would do business with them. Right, so there's there's a process that procurement goes through to verify a supplier before onboarding them, and that process is uh, you know fairly fairly the same across all these companies. So this creates this wallet of information, these documents, and now all of this is this is where we use blockchain because it makes an immutable record of them, right? So that there's some confidence that what is actually uploaded is the authentic information. And then any certificates or like attestations, like a, a Dun and Bradstreet number, all of that we could verify or validate rather using um, external parties, right? So a supplier creates this digital identity. This is recorded on blockchain. They're able to list the categories of medical equipment that they support. And now there are roughly 15, think of these as top level categories, 15 categories of, of goods that are uh, in need. And then they're also able to post the inventory that they have available. And this now gets into a a different IBM uh, software uh, called Sterling Inventory Visibility. And that could accept um, EDI files for bigger suppliers, or it could also take CSV files for smaller ones. And, you know, they could update, the supplier could update as as frequently uh, as they like, right? So... Now, to look at it from the other perspective, if you're a buyer, what does this do for you? So again, think back to the hospital in in New Hampshire. You know, you now have a single place to go to find these alternative suppliers, right? So alternative suppliers 
you have a place to go to find them. And you have a single source of truth uh, for this critical information that you need, right? Before you're willing to do business with them. Um, and you know, you could search the categories uh, to, to find exactly what you need. Maybe you need masks, but you don't need oxygen tanks uh, or whatnot, right? You could quickly zoom in on those categories uh, and then see what inventory they have available, right? Now the actual transaction itself doesn't take place on this platform, right? We wanted to, do, to put something in place that was very quick and focused on an immediate need so then to actually transact the order, you know, typically for big companies, they would be registered on uh, one or more kind of procurement platforms, so like Ariba or Coupa or something else, right? They would then, if they're both on the same platform, they would both go off and do the transaction there, or they would do it, you know, through whatever process they cared to. Um, and to make this easy, right, to make this easy, uh, IBM is supporting it So with people. So to help suppliers and buyers on board quickly, uh, we have a support team that we're standing up. And this will probably expand to other companies as well. So the IBM and others working on this. Uh, and we think you know, it's about 30 minutes to gather the information um, and then you know, for a buyer or a supplier. And then once, once we get it in the system, it takes maybe a day to validate it, right? And then somebody would be uh, would be up and running and IBM is is making this available to buyers and suppliers, you know, during the emergency right now We're saying for 120 days people could come on and use the platform uh, And we want we encourage people to do that. So this is You know now to, to flip to Blockchain talk. This is this is a great example how we could bring something to bear You know using blockchain to fit to fill an immediate and critical need uh, and this is actually, you know, in, in production now, right? And people will be able to use this. And we, everyone at IBM is very excited because we feel that this could really help. So let me, let me stop there and see what questions uh, you all have. No questions so far, but certainly I like the solution. I think the fact that you're making it available for the 120 day window is a great thing, you know, for everybody involved. And in theory, I would agree that this thing should rapidly change the availability of uh, critical inventory items on a supply chain pretty fast. So it's a big deal. Thanks. Yeah, this is Rich Mark. Uh, so, so uh, are there uh, organizations that are sort of uh, already in the process of sort of integrating the solution, uh, making use of the solution? Yeah. Uh, particularly uh, as it relates to COVID? Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, we've been soft launching this for a little while now. And part of that is getting organizations on board. And I can't, because this is a public call now, I can't give specific names, but what, what I will do is give an example. So we've been working with an identity, or a, pardon me, uh, uh, an entity that's known as a paymaster. And you could think of them as, as an escrow agent. So uh, what they've done is they've aggregated uh, companies that want to manufacture, you know, that are pivoting into the space. Most of them are based in Asia. And, you know, they've aggregated those suppliers and we're onboarding all of these suppliers now. And this, this entity, this paymaster acts as an escrow agent and optionally, right, optionally. Uh, so we have like a little trade finance bank in the platform. So what that means is again, let's say I'm, I'm the, the hospital in New Hampshire and the shirt factory in Brazil, even though they're a billion dollar company, let's say they want a million dollars up front to make the PPE. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know about this. So with the paymaster, I could give the money to the paymaster and they put it in escrow, which means they're holding it. And then when the, when the items come in, you know, I go and inspect them. And if they are what, you know, they're, they're supposed to be, I take the items and the paymaster releases the money. Right. And, and that's a way that we, um, uh, a further way that we optionally, you know, can reduce risk uh, to parties. Now we've also been talking to big hospital systems in the country too, as well as group purchasing organizations. And some of them are, are being on board it now too. So when the press release for this goes out next week, which is really sort of the, 
the big announcement. We, we hope to be able to include many of these types of companies in that announcement. But we, you know, we do have to have to almost sort of manifest this network into being, right? Because this only works if we have buyers and suppliers. And the only way we have buyers and suppliers is if buyers and suppliers join. Um, but we're pretty confident that that will, uh, uh, it, you know, the network will grow pretty quickly. So that's a good question. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mark. I, I, we do have to move on. Uh, but uh, if anyone has uh, an interest in sort of following up with Mark, I think uh, maybe the easiest way might be to work through Erica. Uh, Erica is our vice chair for, for the H2 SIG, and I, I believe Erica, uh, she, she works Absolutely. with Mark yes. either directly or indirectly. So that might be the easiest way to sort of make that happen. But again, thank you so much, Mark. I, I appreciate it. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to sort of see this coming together. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so we have uh, Anesu uh, Machoko. Uh, he's our CEO and co-founder for uh, Meta Digital. Uh, and An 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 Anesu, did, did you want to sort of take over and, and, uh, and let's hear. hear yeah, can I, I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, well, someone right. else so is sharing I'll, I'll the screen. Sharing. Yeah. Okay, no, yeah. okay, no problem. There you go. That's fine. Okay. Take it. Uh, okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay. So, uh, thank you again for having me today. I'm going to talk a little bit about Meta Digital and what we are doing. Uh, we are a claims. Uh, uh, a, a prepayment claims verification platform. But along the way, uh, we have seen some opportunities around COVID-19 uh, that relate to what we are doing and other utilities that we could offer to, to different stakeholders, be it payers or even providers. And what I really wanted to focus on, even as we go through the discussion, is not just the regulatory changes that are favorable uh, for, you know, for digital health, but also the incentives that are structured within the stakeholders, right? Why would even, it's not just important to just say we are having a solution for COVID, but what are the incentives for the doctor, for the pharmacy, for the patient to use your solution without you having to heavily incentivize it? Because that makes the difference between whether there's an early adoption or you're stuck into that sales cycle, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to implement your product. So uh, we, are, we are located in San Francisco. So this is uh, an example of the market. I think everyone knows the amount of fraud. If you have estimate around 10% to be fraud, which we think is higher because of survivorship bias, you tend to see that there's a lot of fraud out there. So there's incentives. So for our solution, because there's a lot of fraud and we figure out how much we can, the type of fraud we can stop, our customer, is the insurance company. So we've figured out that our we are going directly to the payer and the payer will bring in other stakeholders, be it providers or, you know, or, you know, lab, labs or even patients to come on board. They'll be incentivized through the, the provider. So this is an example of the size of the market. So this is basically our distribution of the 390. So we kind of like aggregate some of the types of fraud based on some of the guidance from HHS to kind of create four distinct buckets that we can actually break down the frequency and the severity of the types of fraud. And essentially what happens with most of the, um, the post payment verification that happens currently. Uh, essentially, you are having a longer revenue billing cycle and you are, you know, it doesn't really stop identity theft or, or let's say ghost billing, right? That happens a lot. And there's an example uh, that I'll cite with, the, uh, with Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, shortly. So what are some of our applications? So some, our applications work with prescriptions, medical claims, and dental claims. And this is now very important when you think about one of the regulations the government just, uh, just allowed, which is, you know, doctors can now participate, you know, doing telemedicine across state lines. That creates a huge incentive uh, for, for fraud and eliminates one of the constraints that was there. So a long time, if you go into the cotivities of the world, the SARS that actually do post-payment claims verification, if a claim is originated in, uh, by a doctor in Florida and filled in Kentucky, that's fraud 101, 
right? But now some of the regulations now really allow that. They allow you to interact with an out-of-state doctor and then that doctor can actually issue a prescription. Now, how do we know whether that's fraudulent, whether that's actually accurate? So those are some of the challenges that payers are actually wrestling with. So we have applications for prescriptions, medical claims and dental claims. And in this case, as I give you an example, I want you to kind of like think at the end of your back, not the patient showing up at the doctor's office, but now interacting with a doctor that is actually remote, right? Using telemedicine is the opportunity here. So what do we understand about healthcare? So healthcare right now is one of the only industries where a service is provided before any verification happens. And we tend to use the owner system. So if you think about your mortgage loans and credit cards, they all require prepayment verification, yet all the medical claims are post-payment. So we call it a pay and chest model. So essentially that creates loopholes that can be exploited for fraud. So what are we solving here? We're solving a lot of a lack of verification with electronic billing, uh, because electronic billing verifies the doctor, but not the patient or the service provided, which means that if I'm the doctor, I can change the identity of the patient or the identity of the service provided, and the payer will never know. So as, uh, as Rich mentioned, we had, uh, you know, or I mentioned earlier, I think in the introduction with the pilot that is scheduled in September 1st with Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I wanted to bring your attention to a problem that they wrestled with about 18 months ago. It is important to note that this problem, our solution would have stopped this problem immediately. So this is a case in which ghost billing, identity theft, uh, and duplicate billing happened. 500,000 uh, fraudulent claims passed it through uh, the system undetected. And if you look at some of the facts of this story, you had an, a hospital going from 267 claims to 67,000, and it was caught over a nine-month period. So there's clearly survivorship bias and fraud is allowed to pass through. Now put that into the context at the back of your mind as you are watching this presentation, that now the point of contact between you and the provider is probably going to change with COVID-19 as you're going to deal with uh, telehealth. And now we are going to be in a position where we have to authenticate and verify claims that have been originated by doctors through telehealth. How do we have that integration? So that is something that we are actually working on right now. So how do we design our solution? I think this is pretty simple for a lot of people involved in, in Hyperledger Indie because they will understand it. Basically, we are putting uh, confirmation digital confirmation signatures at points of care, right? So this is our prescription solution. For example, the patient in this case, in pre-COVID, the patient would have shown up into the hospital and scanned a QR code and then their their information, health card and insurance information will be ported in the doctor's screen. At this point, we would know the time and location when the doctor and the patient actually met. And then if you go back to this particular case study, the 500,000 fraudulent claims in this case, it actually happened that the doctor and the patient never actually met. So we would be able to stop you know, this type of fraud because we are able to authenticate the point of contact between the, uh, the physician and the patient. A confirmation signature is established. The doctor sends the prescription to the patient's mobile phone. When the patient accepts the, uh, the, the custody of the mobile for, uh, of the prescription, uh, they are authenticating the service that they just got from the doctor and the confirmation signature is established. Then the patient will use a search function to send a prescription to the pharmacy and another confirmation signature is established. Essentially what's happening is that we are creating consensus between the patient, the doctor and the pharmacist before that to figure out what is the time of time and place where the service, uh, the point of care was, was administered, what is the service provided and the unique identity of the participants. So that allows us to verify the claim uh, before prepayment. It also allows us to stop some of the types of fraud that are very difficult for post-payment data uh, analytics, such as cost billing or identity theft, because they tend to be very much more qualitative sometimes. There's a bit of qualitative analysis that needs to be done. Whereas with this, we are creating a secure old trail that is very cheap for the administrative, uh, for post-claim uh, administrative um, analysis. So now when you want to figure out who committed the claim, you know when the doctor and the patient actually met, you know when the patient sent the, uh, the prescription to the pharmacy. So we have a demo, but I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll forward the, 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 the slide deck afterwards because I want, because I want to be within the, uh, the, the eight minutes. So I'll walk you through 
uh, what we have, the traction. But what I wanted to kind of like mention was the distribution channel of how we are able to do this. Because there's a challenge when you are coming up and trying to deal with enterprise partners. Do you go in and integrate into existing applications or do you create yourself a new uh, a new uh, a new marketplace and this now falls into what I wanted to discuss about which is the incentives of the participants right when you are when we are thinking about uh, you know when we are thinking about our solution ourselves we are constantly thinking about why should a payer want to use our solution so basically from our perspective we are able to verify every claim we are using a deterministic method where we are actually verifying for place of connection uh, service provided with unique signatures for everyone involved as compared to outlier sampling, looking for initial transactions, a lot of survivorship bias. So we, have a, uh, we will capture more fraud and we'll be able to reduce the healthcare expenditures that are actually sent. So this allows us to know exactly who our customer is. So our customer is the payer. So when the payer gets the, um, gets the benefit, now they can go and actually incentivize the providers. But we have a shared vision with the, with, the, with, the, with the payers and the providers, so we assist them in this. So how do they get the providers on board? One of the things is the provider or the patient doesn't really care about fraud, to be honest. They don't. They, 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 they only care about making their workflows much better, whether they commit fraud or not. The doctor, the patient do not care about fraud. The only person who cares about fraud is the employer or the insurance company, which is acting as administrator. So in this case, we have to find incentives to get some of the OS providers to want to use our solution. And this is going to be very important as we design some of our solutions for COVID-19, not just coming up with a solution that is, uh, you know, that solves a pain point, but what are the incentives for the participants to use them? So when we did our surveys with doctors, we found out that they really like to be paid a bit earlier. So because now you can verify the claim prepayment, you can reduce that revenue billing cycle from as long as, you know, 30 days to as little as to one to two business days. Um, and also, it's a big problem with hospitals, you know, once a claim gets, you know, uh, you know, someone protests about a claim and then it has to go for further review, that could take more than 120 days. And essentially that puts that claim into default and that affects hospitals bottom line. Um, reduce medical errors, we're using less manual inputs. And one of the things that happens, especially with, uh, with uh, you know, paper prescriptions or other stuff is that doctors spend a lot of time trying to verify people. So now think about this scenario where you have for telemedicine, right? Where the doctor is in Denver and you know, my mom is in Florida and they're trying to interact and I have to verify the doctor, but I also have to verify the pharmacy where, she, where she's going to get the prescription. And oh no, I also have to verify the patient, right? So now you are now seeing how complex it's now going to become when you now have a more, you know, a, a bigger population of doctors to choose from, which is not just constricted to a certain geographical area which creates opportunities uh, where we integrate into, uh, a, into the, with an API into uh, the, uh, the telehealth service, integrate into the EMR service, and then also integrate into the pharmacy management network. So we, as they are relaying information, we are doing the verification behind the scenes. Um, one of the things that we are seeing and uh, that uh, especially with COVID-19 is patient-centric solutions, faster check-ins and reducing overbilling. But one of the things that I wanted to look at is for example, pharmacies. So we, we have been talking to a few pharmacies ourselves. And one of the challenges that, you know, the Walgreens or the CVS is facing is that some of the pharmacies that they deal with are franchises, right? So they're not technically under the thumb of the corporate office. They are run by other people that and those pharmacies also are at financial risk. Right? They're not going to have as many people walk into the doctor's office and, they, and go into the pharmacy afterwards. So that's a business challenge. So what does that mean? It means that now the pharmacy, if they want to maintain a certain level of volume of business, they have to interact with the patient remotely using their mobile phone. And that gives us an idea of, okay, if we can make a prescription claim, a credential that can be passed along with the patient, how do we incentivize one, the doctor to want to use a new work stream to send a, 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 a prescription as a credential to the, to, the, uh, to the patient. Secondly, why would the patient actually want to care about actually having this credential into their hands? And we think that by having the patient being able to interact and connect with their doctor, 
through the insurance patients app and interact with the pharmacists through the insurance patients app and also verify their own claim. It allows them to be in full control of every aspect of their of their healthcare. So this is a uh, you know this is the the final page of my presentation. I would have said a lot of things, but I just wanted to kind of like talk about what we are doing, but also think at the back of our minds about the incentives of the people that are going to use our solutions, right? Because that determines how it's going to be actually applied. So thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Anesu. So I, I am just a little bit mindful of time. I think uh, my, my sort, of, uh, sort of big question here would be, um, how, how do we relate that? Uh, I mean, this is a great workflow uh, that we see here. Uh, how do we relate that to uh, to sort of the COVID virus uh, today? Because uh, it looks really like a compelling uh, workflow that you. Yeah. So, so the way we are doing, uh, we are working with COVID nineteen uh, addressing is we are talking to pharmacies right now, right? Because we are looking at uh, local pharmacies or franchise pharmacies that li literally rely on their business model by having the doctor's office on top of them, right? People showing up and then they have uh, prescriptions filled. And some of them do not have a relationship where they can connect with patients or their patients, or, you know, they're historically their patients remotely. And we are trying to engage with, uh, with some of the big insurance companies, but also pharmacies along the way to make sure that they can have some form of credential that allows people to interact directly with the pharmacy, knowing that when that prescription gets to the pharmacist, the pharmacy can actually authenticate the doctor, can authenticate the patient without really, uh, you know, uh, wasting a lot of time. So I think the pain point here is re how do we cover the amount of business that the pharmacy is losing because of social distancing, people not going out as much, and allowing them to have a verifiable credential that can actually be can be sent remotely and still have the same effectiveness. Excellent. Well, so, so thank you, uh, Anesu, so much for that. And, and just because I'm, I'm a little sensitive to time, I think we want to just uh, yeah. move on uh, and we could uh, perhaps uh, queue up some questions for, uh, for a little yeah, bit later. Uh, I, uh, I, thank you again. Uh, so I want to move over to uh, Consensus Health. Uh, I, so I know Heather isn't available to join us today, but uh, Dr. Jonathan Holt. Uh, Jonathan, did you want to sort of sure. uh, mm -hmm. speak on behalf yeah, of Consensus Health? Yeah, sure thing. Health? Actually, I can uh, have some slides to share. Okay, let me un let me unshare here. Go ahead. Let's see. I have too many windows open. Let's try that one. Okay. Perfect. So That's I'm a J Jonathan Thank Holt. You, Jonathan. Uh, so I'm a triple board certified physician. I'm boarded in genetics, internal medicine, and clinical informatics, and I'm the CMIO, the Chief Medical Informatics Officer for Consensus Health, and. Um, over the last uh, three or four years, I've been, I've been deep in blockchain technologies in healthcare. And to understand that, I've actually I've participated in or have ran about five uh, hackathons. And so as I joined uh, Consensus Health, you know, I really see the, 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 the role hackathons play in, during a, a time of a crisis, such as what we're in right now. And, um, and to quote one of my colleagues, you know, hackathons represent all the good in this world and the power of diverse teams to turn revolutionary ideas into reality. And I would also extend this to this view to deposit that during this crisis, it really demands diverse approaches to come together collaboratively to solve these hard problems and use whatever tools that we have available. I've, over the last uh, four years, you know, participating in hackathons, there's all sorts of uh, people who bring novel ideas to the table. And I think it, during this crisis, I think it really is, it, it begs for this opportunity to present those uh, opportunities of, of what tools actually people are using. And I, and I certainly see and there's, a, there's a lot of developers who migrate to the, the Ethereum platform, uh, mostly because there's not a lot of tools there. There's, but there's certainly, I see a lot of, of applications um, using uh, the Hyperledger tools, including uh, Aries, uh, Indy, um, you know, I myself at one of the hackathons worked on uh, Indy uh, extensively. And so I think um, that really is a, an ability to work collaboratively to see what tools can help solve um, these several problems. And I think it's, 
it's this time of a crisis where, you know, I, I don't want to, people to stand by and be a, a helpless bystander. And uh, my own story is that when I was uh, 13, I saw a, a horrible motorcycle accident. And I, I stood there for about 30 minutes, you know, watching the paramedics rescue this, this victim. And it was that moment that I realized that I didn't want to be a helpless bystander my whole life. And it really motivated me to become a paramedic and ultimately a, a physician. And it is in that, 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 approach that we approach this, this, these things with um, a hackathon of sort of approach, which is that really it's having the right attitude, skills, and awareness. And that is the attitude that you're not going to be a help bystander and you have the skills to do something and you're aware of what's wrong in the world and actually how to make it right. So, um, which is why we've launched the, the hackathon to actually just sort of help think our way out and find a solution collaboratively. Uh, so, I always see this as being in uh, three major buckets for um, the, the entities that are involved in helping this in, during this crisis. And it also emphasizes our strategic vision uh, from consensus. And that really boils down to information, resources, and people. So information, do we have authentic, validated information? Um, who's at risk? Who's on the front line? What's, what, where are the hot spots that are actually happening right now? And it's amazing that we actually, we don't have a good eyes on this, you know, the, as far as testing, uh, who's at risk, um, even just the community spread. I saw a report this morning that showed that the people who are asymptomatic are, they're about uh, over 50% of people don't show any symptoms and test positive for COVID-19. And I think hence why we're actually in this, you know, global lockdown mode of, of really trying to contain this. Um, but the second part of this is the resources. Um, uh, this gets into supply chain management, secure and trusted uh, s supplies. And then finally, people, the, the heroes who are actually on the boots on the ground. You know, do they have uh, what they need? Or do they have the right credentials? And how are we supporting uh, those troops on the front line? So in short, the, the mantra that I've been saying as far as this hackathon is uh, data is the medicine that we need. And blockchain is yet just another tool that we can use to help automate this process of sharing authenticated information. And with that, we're adopting the McKenzie's uh, strategic approach where we see five phases of this crisis. And it really has to do with um, first resolve, and that has to do with resolving the current crisis, containing it, mitigating it, suppressing it, but also really important to, to, that we actually stand resolute in our mindset and tackle this crisis with the right character and to the right um, ap uh, approach, going back to this idea of that we're not going to be a victim and we're going to get out of this uh, together to, to think our way out of, with a solution, to engineer a solution. And then second, the resilience to survive this crisis. Uh, finally, this concept of returning to normal and what is the new normal going to look like? Well, we're going to reimagine it. And so we're going to re-engineer what the new normal is going to look like. Uh, and finally, actually, we're going to see that um, actualized. But it really is going to be this process of us engineering uh, a, a, our way out of this and reimagining what the future is going to look like. And so we've already actually already uh, kicked off the hackathon. Um, so it started this Monday and uh, the teams are forming. And unlike other hackathons that I've participated in, we're actually stretching this out to be over two to three weeks long. And the reason being is that actually we really want some thoughtful process. In some hackathons, you sort of actually like you, you throw together some code and you present it and it's, the, it's a team with the, the snazziest sort of presentation that actually like, you know, win. But really actually we want some, some hard, thoughtful approaches of engineering solutions. And um, so I'm proud to say that um, Brian Bellendorf, uh, who I think is on the, on the call, is actually going to be one of our judges, as well as um, Joe Lubin, um, Alex Callahan, Debbie Bucci, and, um, so we're, and uh, Heather Flannery, uh, my CEO. And I think we're, you know, we're, again, not uh, we're certainly emphasizing the Ethereum platform, but there's so many different touch points. As you all know, um, uh, Project Bezo has actually been donated to the Hyperledger Foundation, which is based on um, the Ethereum blockchain. And there's so many other touch points, uh, including um, I've been heavily involved in verifiable credentials with um, the de decentralized identifier specification. And so there's a lot of touch points with the project and work that's coming out of uh, the Indie project, as well as the uh, ARIES. Uh, cryptographic primitives coming out of the Ursa uh, project. And so I think it really is to highlight the opportunities of touch points of interoperability uh, to actually get us through uh, this crisis. So um, we've actually already had some, um, 
some great uh, meetings this week to actually to, to office hours, to actually to help the developers actually to understand the tools. And um, like I said, the judging goes until um, May uh, 11th. And we have some wonderful partners, including Hyperledger uh, and the other ones listed below. And with that, I'll take some questions. Well, excellent. Uh, th thank you so much, Jonathan. Yeah, uh, any questions? Um, just a quick one. Where Do you have a link to where the work is actually being collected that's online somewhere? I assume it's like GitHub or something like that. Yeah, so it's actually Gitcoin, which is actually a project that actually uses GitHub. And I will put the, the link in. And I think actually it should be in the, in the meeting notes. I think Heather actually did give you a All link right, thanks. to that. Yeah, actually there it is. Actually, it's the, the Stop COVID-19 Ethereum Hackathon. Yeah, there, there we go. Perfect. And we're also uh, really, uh, so we actually have over 60 mentors signed up for this. And so, um, and the mentors, uh, if, if you guys gone to a, a hackathon, is that there's a lot of people who sort of, uh, they, they, they are great technicians and developers, but they, they, they lack the understanding of either healthcare or life sciences to understand um, what the problems need solving. So we've actually come up, um, and this has actually worked well with other hackathons where we actually teamed um, the developers with mentors. So, so far we've had over 60 mentors sign up and we're in the process of pairing the, the participants with those mentors to um, help them understand the business and, and uh, problems in healthcare that need solving. And, uh, uh, and we've done this uh, online uh, in a way that's just unprecedented. I think it's actually, it's a wonderful example of actually how we can get together to solve these hard problems. Um, can I ask, do you have a tracing application as part of, I'll call it the solutions you're looking at? So I'm open to any and all. And, and some of the people ask, ask like things like uh, 3D printed ventilators, you know, should, could that be a, a solution to actually present? And I'd say, yeah, um, you know, hook in, it, it, it certainly like a 3D printed ventilator would actually need to, how do you strategically share, uh, disseminate the, the schemas? How do you actually get that certified? How do you actually get the ventilator to the, thir the, to, to the front line? So it's any sort of approach, you know, I, I'm agnostic to ha having a predetermined fixed uh, solution. I, I'm really thinking about how can we actually engineer our, our way out of this crisis? And it really is about not necessarily, it's only there's an emphasis on the Ethereum platform, but there's so many touch points for, for collaborative interoperability with all of the solutions. Okay. Um, so there's, I guess there's, I'll say at least three main areas that people have been looking at. One is the supply chain. We heard that earlier on the IBM side, but there's so many issues in there that you mentioned equipment, all kinds of stuff. Um, so that's a huge area, but it also has a lot of focus, which is good. There's the second area um, is testing, which has been a major problem in a lot of countries, including the U.S. And it looks like there's momentum to go the way Florida just did this week, where they said we're going to have unlimited testing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so in a sense, I don't need a doctor. I can say, "Gee, I think I got a fever. I can go to a drive-through location." So that, although that capability yeah. isn't there where it needs to be, um, if that is fully delivered, let's put it that way, then that does address a big issue there. And the last one, I think, is the current lockdown, social distancing, and all that um, can be reduced if you have better contact tracing, you know, obviously. Yeah, and exactly. And I think one, so. My I only. Hear, I don't hear anything about that really um, that's significant. You know, there's no sort of efforts that I see focused on that. Yeah, and so uh, certainly there's, there's opp opportunities abound. Uh, for instance, I'm a physician. I guess got my emergency credentials uh, here in Illinois uh, to participate in the front lines. And so certainly credentialing management is an issue. I, I've been heavily involved in that with uh, verifiable credentials and onboarding of physicians um, using like QR codes. And I think, um, and it, it, there is the, this, this mantra in medicine also is that, you know, you, you first do no harm. And so I think this is amazing technologies, but I think it's about the right implement, implementation of technologies. Um, but, you know, one certain opportunity for automation, uh, like the, you know, there's a form from the CDC called the person under investigation. And currently, as a physician, it's a, it takes you about a half hour to fill out the form and you have to fax it to the CDC. And so that to me is just mind boggling and ripe for an innovative approach to how to ultimately to, to get the right information authenticated, validated to the right people, 
to get the right information, to allocate the right resources um, for, to, to help fight the, this battle. You're right. That's, those are huge issues, uh, both FDA and CDC processes that, in a sense, don't work the way they need to work effectively in a, I'll call it a, a quick and accurate uh, process is a big issue. But in a larger sense, I do look at this contact tracing problem as a way that, in effect, you can remove or lower, I should say, as they said yesterday about the phases, um, to open up society again, you need to be able to, in a sense, have effective contact tracing that makes it work easily for everyone. Yeah, so, so, and I think that one of the, the pillars I think that I was hoping to highlight is the opportunity for zero knowledge proofs. And uh, that's something that we, we at Consensus Health actually have a very strong um, approaches to. And I think it's, it's, but it really needs to be the touch points of interoperability. I've seen a lot of zero knowledge proof implementations, but it really is about, um, you know, how, how do you understand the zero knowledge uh, in a way that actually is like is zero knowledge and yet semantically interoperable and that's that's a, a whole challenge by itself uh, yeah semantic semantic interoperability is a big issue absolutely yeah uh well thank you jonathan i appreciate it very much um any questions uh for any of our speakers uh before we sort of move on to sort of the last sort of segment uh as we're rolling up to the top of the hour Alrighty, so I, I just wanted to close out. Um, and first of all, thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, it's been great. Uh, the, really, the value of, of getting our speakers sort of engaged in, uh, in this discussion is to, to sort of uh, shed some light on various sort of facets of, of how we might solve some of these problems. We, we heard uh, several today, which is great. Uh, as we've, uh, over the past uh, really month and a half or so, learned a little bit more about how uh, different organizations are approaching these sorts of problems in different ways, which is phenomenal. Uh, I think uh, getting a little sense uh, for how everyone sort of thinks uh, and organizations approach this problem a little bit differently, I think is valuable. Um, as well, uh, and this is probably a little bit more to fundamentals for some smaller organizations uh, and startups, uh, and, and actually some larger organizations as well, uh, there's always uh, interest in understanding funding opportunities. Uh, on this page, as we've been doing uh, sort of going forward, uh, we continue to sort of update on funding opportunities, both global uh, and then here in the US. Uh, so feel free to read through this. I, I don't think we'll walk through these today necessarily, but uh, make use of this as a resource uh, to you and your organizations. Um, uh, this, is, this is all very, very good information. And of course, uh, given the nature of the COVID virus, this is very, very dynamic as well. Uh, I will call out uh, one point that, that came online very, very early this morning, and so I was able to get this on the agenda very quickly. Uh, we have a, a COVID help for families, uh, that the page that just kicked off, uh, and I'll, sh I'll show it to you here. Uh, this is really a matchmaking opportunity, uh, helpers uh, versus, the, versus those that need help. Uh, and uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have you sort of walk through that, and that just came online earlier. Um, it's not necessarily, uh, blockchain technology is uh, specific, but it, it is another sort of representation of how we might think in terms of engaging uh, sort of sort of endpoints here. Uh, and I think Jonathan makes a really good, good point from his point of view as a physician, uh, how, do we, how do we sort of connect the dots here? And I think that's sort of our ongoing issue going forward. Alrighty, well, thanks everyone. Uh, very much appreciated as always. Um, and again, if you're fairly new to the organization here and this, uh, the healthcare special interest group, please feel free to get yourself engaged uh, at, at a more granular level. Uh, again, we have uh, three great subgroups that are working uh, pretty regularly. And uh, we also have some other opportunities within the special interest group to, to continue to get engaged. Uh, very likely, uh, we'll continue with these special uh, meeting topics because uh, these are really, um, really critical. And of course, we know that this is an ongoing issue that hasn't, uh, hasn't gone away quite yet. So thanks, everyone. Uh, be safe, uh, first and foremost, uh, and have a great weekend. And we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.